We are continuing work on our septic system and the next step is to lay the pipe from the septic tank to the leach field. It's about 170 feet and we need to lay both the septic line and also we are putting a one inch conduit for networking so that we can set up uh, some camera and sensors by the leach field. Well, we encountered a slight delay. It turns out that the pipe coming out of the septic tank is a two inch pipe, but our line to the septic field is inch and a half pipe. So Matt went to the store to grab a reducer. So Matt got the uh, reducing fitting and now we're back in action. Okay, we're back at it again today. So yesterday wasn't overly successful. We did manage to install a small coupler. So the pipe coming out of the tank here is a two inch pipe. And what we need to connect on is inch and a half. Unfortunately, the, there's a bit of a curve that has to happen. So the, this first piece of pipe is gonna have to curve a little bit to come around here. And the coupler is so short that when we tried to put that on, we found that the long pipe just, it couldn't get a nice straight connection on there. So instead what we did is last night we glued on the coupler and a short length of inch and a half. So this now has had all evening and all night to, to, to cure. And that is now a really sturdy, strong connection. Now we have an inch and a half piece that we can put the conventional belled end on, which is about a, I don't know, a two or three inch kind of overlap rather than the, what is it, less than an inch, maybe three quarters of an inch of overlap on that one. So fingers crossed today, we can get a lot of pipe installed pretty quickly. Well, the pipe is now installed and we're gonna leave that to cure either until later on today or possibly even until tomorrow. So in the meantime, we are starting on the next little project, which is the inlet to the tank. Now for this, we need to have a baffle. So that's this piece here. Uh, that's going to go inside the, uh, the tank and that will be connected to this length of four inch pipe here. And that will stick out of the, the tank. So we need to make sure the baffle goes in deep enough you can get to it to see it, to clean it, whatever, from the riser. So it's got to stick in a decent decent length inside the tank there. And then on the outside, we're going to have it sticking out about 18 inches. And that is so that we can attach the Y fitting on to split between the utility building and the main house. The utility building will have a second Y fitting just after the first, which will actually raise to grade. And that's going to be a clean out. We're not going to install those two Y fittings just yet. The reason being that uh, we still need to backfill around the tank. And that whole assembly is going to stick out about four feet or so. And it's just a recipe for something getting damaged. Those things are easy to install later. So we're going to wait until the back side of the tank is backfilled, leaving just the front exposed. Then we can come in and install those couple of Y fittings and, uh, and the clean out and bring everything up to grade. And hopefully that way nothing will get damaged. So I'm going to glue on the, uh, the baffle to the end of this. Diana is going to remove the, um, the riser lid we're gonna put the ladder down inside again, cut out the little rubber gasket that's down there and get this installed. Also condensation. Yeah.
Okay. Okay, it wants to come back in towards you a little bit, about three inches. Another inch and a quarter. Sharpie's gonna walk about from the car again. Because the nights are getting close to freezing, we don't want to leave the pipe being pressure tested overnight just in case it does freeze overnight and freezes the pipe and bursts it. That would kind of defeat the object of all the work we're doing to stop it freezing. So we're going to pressure test that tomorrow. Rather than wasting the afternoon though, we've been working on the electrical. So we've got three pieces of conduit we need to attach to the septic post, three one inch pieces. And if you look over here, I can show you what those are going to be. So we've already installed the two inch piece. This is what's going down into the tank for all the wiring for the pump. The one inch coming from this side here is actually gonna tuck below that 90 there and come off this way. And that will go off to the utility building to provide uh, power for this. So we'll have a couple of, of circuits coming through there to provide power to the pump, the alarm, and in future a receptacle as well. The other two pieces of conduit are gonna go on the low voltage side of this post and they're gonna contain ethernet cable, CAT6E cable. One of those will be coming from the utility building. That's going to bring Cat6E over to, to this post. And that's to connect to the sensors. We're going to have a uh, sort of a hardware system in here to take those sensor readings and send those back to the utility building. That will also have power over Ethernet. So there will be power going over that cable as well, low voltage uh, power. The second uh, one inch conduit is going to go down from here and follow the inch and a half pipe all the way up to the edge of the leach field where it's gonna terminate at a post. That's gonna be very similar to the camera post that we put at the top of the driveway. This one will run a camera possibly up there to look at either the septic or there's an access point to the property up there. Gives us a kind of a security camera up there. It also gives us anything uh, for sensors. So if we wanna put any sensors out in the leach field, we can have a radio receiver up there adjacent to those sensors. So we don't need to have very powerful wireless sensors if we do decide to do something up there in future. So what we've done, because these are fairly intricate, there's the expansion fittings, there's the terminating adapters, there's some 90s here. These are slightly complex fittings. So what we've done is we've pre-assembled all of those different pieces for about the first full length stub of conduit basically. And then we're gonna bring those over and put them in. The one that we're most worried about is the one that's gonna come off the back of here and head up with the pipe, because it has to do this kind of crazy loop around here. So it's gonna do a 90 down and then a 45 across and then have to bend again. There is only one 90 at that end, so there's no issues there with too many 90s. Same with the ones coming off this way. We've counted how many turns we're gonna be and we're fine. But this one in particular, it's gonna be a little tricky. So we're gonna get that installed. Hopefully it's been curing now for about an hour or so. So that should be nice and solid and we shouldn't have any issues with those joints breaking. These two pieces of conduit here are basically identical. It's a an adapter to go into the junction box, an expansion fitting, piece of conduit down to the 90, and then one full 10 foot length of one inch conduit. The only difference between them is actually the orientation of the writing on the PVC conduit. Now this is something that we're trying to pay attention to. We don't wanna have the writing. I mean, conduit is not particularly pretty at the best of times, but what we don't want is all the writing, the barcodes and the, the specification information on the visible side if we can avoid it. So you'll notice this one here, you can see all the writing comes down this side and that's going to be the face that's on the, the, the post. So from the other side, you won't see it at all. This one here is, is exactly the opposite. All the writing comes down this side. And so that one will be on the other side of the post. And that way, as we're looking at the post, you'll never actually see that writing. And that is going to make my OCD very happy. And this is why you really enjoy going <laughs> home because you can pay attention to this stuff. Yeah, I don't know if that's something that a professional electrician would be paying attention to or not, um, but it is something that, that matters to us and we are trying to take care to do. Okay. Okay, it's vertical? Yeah.
Well, that's the end of another day working on the septic system here. I feel pretty pleased with what we've managed to accomplish today. We've got all of the conduit in around the post now. So those two pieces, they're gonna go back to the utility building as well as the, the long conduit run up to the, towards the leach field. I think that's about 170 feet uh, that we've got in there. We've got the pipe in, we've got the conduit in. We're gonna leave all that to cure overnight. Tomorrow we're gonna come back, start packing some sand around it, just to make sure everything's secure, and nothing's gonna move, get all that compacted down. We're also gonna pressure test it tomorrow and find out if that pipe that we uh, we put in has uh, good joins and, and will hold water pressure. We have to see 50 PSI for two hours uh, in that line. So if it holds it for 20 minutes, it's probably gonna hold it for two hours. So we should know pretty quick if we've got any problems. We don't have to test it at this point. We actually don't need to test it until uh, we get all the way to the leach field to the T in the middle of the mound, which is about another 50 or 60 feet of pipe after where we are. But we figured we'd rather test it now initially, make sure that it's all good before we backfill all of this, rather than backfilling at all, finding out later we've got a problem and having to dig it up and diagnose it. So that's why we're gonna do the pressure test early. We're gonna do a second one later, which is the one that's required for the inspection for the, uh, the septic system. Today, we are doing the first pressure test as part of our septic system installation. In order to do the pressure test, we need to get some water into the pipe. There are two ways of doing pressure testing. One is to use air and one is to use water. It is highly, highly recommended to use water if possible. In fact, looking at all of the PVC cements and things that we've got, all of them say, do not pressure test with air. The pipe says the same as well. Instead, we're going to be using water. And for that, we've got a hydraulic pressure testing kit. We'll put a link uh, in the description below to the products on Amazon that we bought, but it is a, a pressure testing, hydraulic pressure testing uh, kit and a separate gauge that I bought because the kit can go way higher pressure than we need. We only need to pressure test at 50 PSI. In order to do that though, we do need to get water into the line. And the most efficient way to do that is to pump it into the pipe. Well, fortunately for us, we have a pump. This pump station here is the pump. And we're gonna use this to pump water up into that line. At the top, we've got the pressure testing gauge attached. We can close the valve on that once there's water in the line and close the valve down here and do that pressure test. So the first thing that we need to do is get water into this tank. We have power and we have well. So we have plugged in the well into our uh, electric backboard and we have a hose coming down all the way from there to here. And Matt is going to uh, turn on the pump now. Okay, I'm ready. Water should be heading your way. Yep, I hear it. And we have water. So that water is coming directly from our well. We need to get enough to cover the bottom of the pump, which is where the inlet is. So we'll probably come to about maybe halfway up the pump, maybe a little bit more. The tank holds a thousand gallons, so this is gonna take a little while to fill. Afterwards, we'll probably want to drain it as well, which is gonna take even longer, because our transfer pump is nowhere near as fast as our well pump. Yeah. How are we gonna get power for the transfer pump? We need to use our 12 volt battery, or I guess we can pull the generator over here, which given um, how long it's gonna to have to run for, we may want to do. Yeah. Uh, we don't have an extension cord long enough to reach from all the way over there to here. So same with the, the pump in here, we're gonna to have to use the generator to run this because we don't have the, the long extension cord. I saw some at a yard sale not so long ago, <laughs> and they were almost giving them away for free, and they were like 50 foot long cords, and for something like this, they would have been perfect. We don't need to run it for very long. They were pretty heavy gauge extension cords. And I thought, no, we don't have space for them. I won't get them now. And I've been kicking myself ever since. Okay, so now we'll let this pump some water. It took over an hour to get the pump tank filled to about the halfway point of that bottom float. So it's now in a position where if the pump were running, it would stay running, but it hasn't reached that top point that'll actually turn the pump on. So here's the plan. We're gonna manually actuate that float, uh, float switch. We're gonna lift the float up to trigger it to turn on. It will stay in that on state then until the water gets down to the low point, which is about the top of the pump. Based on the amount of travel it's got, that's gonna give us about 75 gallons or so, which should be plenty to, to fill this, this pipe here. I think we need about 20 or 30 gallons to do that. At the other end of the pipe, we've got the pipe mechanism 
attached for the pressure testing kit, uh, system, but we haven't actually attached the pressure testing kit yet. We're going to do that in a minute. When we, we do, that gives the ability to pump a little bit more water into the end. So it doesn't matter if there's a small air pocket at the end, we can bleed that off. But we are gonna turn on this pump to do the majority of the filling of that. We did do a very, very brief couple of second test run of the pump just to make sure that our electrical was all hooked up. We haven't otherwise run this pump yet. So this is kind of exciting. We're, we're kind of intrigued to see what happens here. Fingers crossed it all works well. We have the generator, we have power plugged in. So I'm gonna start that generator, turn on power. We've got the valve here open. We've got things open up there and let's pump some water. All right, so I've tried manually activating the float switch there. So that should be in an on state now. So when I turn on power, Diana's waiting at the top and she's gonna tell me if it starts running. Hopefully this doesn't airlock. Okay, I don't hear anything and the generator hasn't spun up, so the pump hasn't turned on yet. Let me see if I can manually lift that float switch again. There we go. So now that's running. Okay, I think we overloaded the generator there. So let's have a look what happened. Now, unlike our well pump, the, gener the effluent pump in here does not have a soft start. So it is pretty hard on the generator. If we need to, we'll hook up the second generator in the parallel kit, and uh, that will give us a good bit more juice on that, on that generator if we need it. But let's try this again. Okay. Okay, let's so overload the generator again. So we still don't have anything up there. I can see water coming out of a fitting that we loosened here. And we loosened that just to uh, A, hopefully reducing the airlocks and B, so that we can make sure we can loosen it later. I'm gonna reset the generator again. Generator has tripped again. It's still tripping. All right, so that was not successful. I could see the pump. It was spraying water out of this fitting here that we loosened, so that's okay. Obviously I managed to run and bleed some air out and I could see water coming out of there. So water was making it that far. That valve is open, so it's not that. Water is obviously heading up the pipe. Something is working, but I think it's just our generator is getting overloaded. It keeps tripping the overload switch on there. That little generator there, when it's just on its own, I think it has a peak running watts of about 23, 2350 watts, and uh, running watts of about 1900. So my guess is this is just putting a little bit too much at the start, particularly just as it gets up and running. We can parallel that with a second generator, and that will increase the power available on a single outlet from I think it defaults to on here about 15 amps, it'll give us a full 20 amps. So I think it might be time to break open that parallel kit and give ourselves some more power. So this is a simple parallel kit that we've got on here. It, uh, we bought it when we bought the generators. This is the first time we've used it. And essentially all it does is gives up to 3000 watts to either of the generators. So hopefully this will give enough power to the 20 amp outlet that we're connected to, to run the, or the 15 amp outlet, to run the pump and not bog down the generators. Let's find out. Okay, so Diana is in position and we're turning on now. Both generators are working hard, it's staying stable. There's definitely water spraying out in here, but I'm hoping there's plenty coming out at that end. And Diana's gonna give me the sign when the water makes it up. <laughs> oh, I didn't need Diana. That was a pretty good spray. I, uh, the water there shot up about 10 feet up in the air. So uh, that was pretty obvious when that water arrived up there. That worked for the generator anyway, so a bit of a pain we have to run both, but it'll work. Now I should say that normally you wouldn't want to run a pump for such a short amount of time. Um, it should be on for at least a minute. In our case, I'm okay with it being such a short time because it's just a one-off test that we're doing. But generally speaking, this will run for probably about three minutes each time the, the pump kicks on.
This is the pressure testing apparatus that we're using. This is basically a water reservoir and a pump. And it's connected in to this piece that I made and we coupled on here to the end of the pipe. Now I originally made this to test at the T. So this was meant to be done in a vertical position. This would have been at the top. This would have been on the side. This here, I'm basically using as an air bleeder valve. So any air that's in here will be able to come out of there. So I'm trying to keep that high. So I'm trying to lift this up a little bit. It'll probably leave a small air pocket in the end that I won't be able to get out in this orientation, but that's about the best we can do. The way it essentially works is when you pump this handle, water is pumped through this hose and into the pipe. Right now, it's just gonna be filling the air that was left behind when uh, the pump got turned off that would have kind of splashed out or drained out. It holds a couple of gallons. If we need to refill it, we've got a bucket over there to put a bit more in, but we know the pipe is mostly full because we did that with the pump. Once it is completely full and water's coming out of here, I can close that valve and that seals this system in to the hydraulic uh, testing gear. On here, we have a gauge and as I continue to pump, that gauge will quickly rise in pressure. Water is not compressible. And this is the reason it's better to test with water than air. If you test with air, the air compresses and it wants to expand. And that way, if there is any failure in the system, it can be quite explosive. 50 PSI is enough to, to cause quite a, an explosive bang if something does rupture. Water is not compressible at all in comparison to air. It compresses a tiny, tiny amount, but really not much. And that means as I start pressing this more and more on the pump, that pressure will rise really fast. But when the pressure's released, it's not explosive. It's not under so much pressure like air would be that it blows something to shreds. And it's a lot, lot safer therefore to test with. So I've got, uh, right now, I've got the valve one open. That's letting me pump into this system. And valve two is closed, which is what brings the, the water back into this test uh, system. Once I've got it up to pressure, I will close valve one. And that will then lock this system, essentially, decoupling everything but the gauge and this hose from the pressure testing apparatus and we'll just let it sit there for a while. Hopefully it'll hold pressure. Let's find out. Need to open up valve again. So there you can see water starting to come out. So I want to raise this up as much as possible so that any air left in there is bled out through the top. And then I can close that valve. So that system is now completely full of water. As I now pump this handle, we can see the pressure gauge starting to rise. So that is now pressurizing the system. So we're up to about 40 PSI. I'm gonna bring it just above 50, somewhere there. So about 55, 56. And then I'm gonna close valve one. Nice and tight. I'm gonna open valve two. That just drains anything back into the, the tank here that was in there. So that pump now is disconnected. That's not doing anything because valve two is open. So valve two open, valve one nicely closed. This system is now sitting at, where are we there? 53 PSI. So we're just gonna leave this. And the test that we have to do on the final system, according to our engineer, is that the system should hold pressure from the tank up to the T at 50 PSI for two hours. I think this sounds like a good time to go and get some lunch, leave this system sitting here, and hopefully when we come back, we'll still see 53 PSI. We've left this about an hour or so now, and the pressure has dropped just a little bit. It's about 48 PSI right now. So it's dropped about five PSI. We actually noticed it doing this the other day with the test kit. I think it's just as the system initially settles, uh, just the pressure finds its way around in some of the threads and things. So we're just gonna pump this back up to about the same level, about 53 PSI, reset that timer for two hours and try again later. So that now is at exactly 54 PSI. All right, so it's the next morning and we've just been to check on our pressure testing gauge and we didn't quite find the result we were expecting. The pressure has actually gone up by about seven or eight PSI, I think it was, uh, compared to yesterday, which kind of got us scratching our heads for a second. How does the pressure go up in a closed system? And then we realized the one thing that has changed between yesterday and today is the temperature. And not that that's necessarily affecting the water, we don't think too much, but on a length of PVC pipe this long, 
We're talking about uh, about 160 feet of PVC pipe here. The temperature change can actually be pretty substantial and it can be a few eighths of an inch over 100 feet. So given the lengths that we've got, it could have contracted by just shy of about an inch uh, in terms of total length, which is pretty substantial. And the pipe is exposed. Obviously later on it will be buried underground. It won't have such pronounced changes in, in size, I guess. But that is a good reminder as to why we installed these expansion fittings on conduit. That is exactly what these are for, and it's to take into account the change in length of conduit given temperature. But the fact is that our uh, pressure testing kit has shown that the pipe is holding pressure. We didn't check on it yesterday because we got sidetracked with some other tasks. We put some sand in uh, around here uh, just to uh, protect the conduit and get that all bedded in. And same down here as well. We've got some, some sand and some crushed rock under there as well. We also got to cutting some firewood logs uh, that have been in this big mess of a pile over here. We, uh, we got to cutting some of those. So we left that until this morning, the pressure testing apparatus, we have checked on it. And like I say, we're looking good. So the plan now is to start backfilling. The way we're gonna be doing that is by putting sand into this trench. That rock will come out. That's just holding things in place right now. But we're gonna be putting sand in here. Once we've got a layer of about six inches deep of sand, get it compacted. We're then going to be adding in some foam insulation board, two foot wide strip all the way up. We don't love having to put this much foam insulation board in the ground. Uh, it's expensive. It's almost $50 a sheet for a four by eight sheet right now. And we need a good number of sheets to get up here. But also the environmental cost of that foam insulation board isn't good. Um, however, in this case, we don't have a ton of choice. Uh, it is a relatively shallow trench because the amount of rock that we hit under there. We are going to be bringing grade higher than it is here. So you can you can kind of tell from the height of this, this riser, this is, this is final grade. So you can see at least on this first section here, the pipe will be nicely covered. And then further up, we're actually gonna mound over the, uh, the, the, the trench a little bit to give it more protection as well. Plus you'll remember that we were really, really careful to make sure we had a steady grade all the way up. So that after the pump has run, there'll be a weep hole down inside here that we haven't drilled yet so that we can pressure test it but that weep hole will allow the, the liquid inside the pipe to drain back into the tank. Time to get back filling. Well, it's just after lunch. Before lunch, we managed to get all of the sand in here. I had the comparatively easy job. I was running the tractor back and forth to the sand pile 
while Diana was doing all the hard work, raking it in. It was a little bit sketchy on the tractor as well. At one point it tipped up onto just one wheel. I got, even with the ballast, uh, ballast box in the back and the loaded tires, the sand in the front is so heavy and the ground here is pretty uneven. It rocked all the way forward onto, onto one tire. So I've been taking it pretty steady. And that is why I did not want to drive the tractor. <laughs> it's looking fantastic. We've been over it, been over it with a rake now. The next task is to put the plate compactor on here. So this layer is about six inches deep. So there shouldn't be any issues there with the pipe uh, bursting. We have left it hooked up to the pressure testing gauge up at the top. So we, we will find out if we, uh, if we damage anything, but fingers crossed we don't. Once we've got it compacted, then we can uh, start to lay the foam board. The sand is compacted and we kind of evened it out a little bit with the rake. And now it's time for putting some foam board in. This is the world's least sharp knife. I use this knife for everything but cutting usually. It's my screwdriver, it's my pry bar, but the downside is that it doesn't cut very well. But, but it has a deeper blade. It has a longer than blade than Diana's one. And so on these three thin edges that we're cutting off. You can't really get enough uh, to kind of leverage to snap it. So you sort of do need to cut all the way through. So what we're doing with these is cutting the ends at an angle so that as the boards join up, the trench isn't a perfectly straight line. And so that way we can butt the edges tightly against each other and follow the contours or the, the, the turns, I guess, within the, within the trench and then get a single continuous line all the way up. We are also taping the boards together. It's not so much for insulation purposes, it's not really gonna do much there. What it will do though is hold the boards together so that as we start to backfill, it'll hopefully avoid them moving too much, sliding out of line, leaving gaps that will impact the insulation value. So we had the tape handy, it made sense to, uh, to put that in and uh, so far it's working really well. It's making the whole process really quick. So let's go and put this board in. So like now, if I just want to move this board just ever so slightly over, I can do it. I see. And the tape will kind of hold it. Okay. There. Ah! There's the tape. And that'll just hold these two boards together as we back fill. Well, that went way quicker than we thought, and now it's time to put some sand on top of the foam board so it doesn't blow away. We finished burying all the septic pipe and the conduit in here. We've installed the foam and covered that up with some sand to hold it down as well. The pipe here is still under pressure. Um, I'm reading about 57, 58 PSI on this gauge, which is exactly where it was 24 hours ago. So really happy that everything's holding pressure there. It has fluctuated a little bit during the day with temperature, like we, we explained earlier, but now we're looking pretty stable. Now that the pipe's buried, it should also be a lot more stable as well. Our contractor is gonna come along and really help us with the next part. We need to build a big mound back here and install the pipe work to, to get to that. So we've got about as far as we can go for now, and it could be a week or so before our contractor's here. Now, as we're filming this, it is early October here in Vermont and temperatures are dropping. We've already had one night below freezing and more are probably on the cards in the next week or so. So we don't wanna leave this system exposed with water in it. We're gonna drain the water out. To drain it out, there is a valve down there that we can loosen. Uh, I did loosen it enough that it was just spraying some water when we filled the tank. There's a check valve that's holding pressure right now. We can undo that valve and that will kind of leak the water back out. We're hoping that's going to be enough to let some of the water drain back. We can completely loosen that valve um, if we need to and, and let all of the, um, the water out. The other thing we can do is we've got a valve on the end here. This is just a regular hose type valve. I could turn that now and it would <laughs> it would spray water out here. And that's really what this, this valve is for. It's to allow us to decom uh, decompress the system to reduce the pressure. What we can also do here though, is we can attach a, a regular uh, Schrader valve. So an air, uh, like you'd find on a bike tire or a car tire 
Uh, it's a, an adapter that is one of those into one of these. We had it for winterizing our RV. You can blow air into the pipes and uh, empty out all the water. So we can do the same here. We can actually pump air into here under pressure and hopefully force all of the water out. We're gonna see if gravity is gonna do a lot of the work for us, but we'll uh, resort to that if we have to. So the question is, do we open the valve this end or that end? Let's do both ends. Yeah, which one first, this one? This one, but since we're here. Okay, let's see what happens. Hopefully there, the one, the hopefully there won't be too much water coming out of here, but let's find out. Okay, that's it. So pressure's gone to zero. That's the amount of, of compressibility, if you like, that water has. That small amount of water is essentially what was being held under pressure in this pipe for 160 feet of pipe. Well, change of plans. We had misinterpreted how that tri-check valve works. And even when it's in the open position, it still functions as a check valve and is not letting water back past it. Wait, so what does the closed position do then? Closed locks it off from this side as well. Um, so no water would pump out this way, I think. I think that's how it, it works. Either way, we've tried pressurizing the water back in there now with the valve open and we can't push water past it. So uh, that plan to pressurize the system to push the water out isn't gonna work. Instead, what we're gonna try and do is uh, cut the pressure testing apparatus off the end, which was the plan anyway, once it was drained. Um, so I've got the reciprocating saw that we'll use to do that. Once that's cut off, a load of the water will drain out the top anyway. Most of the pipe now is buried. So we're not too worried about that freezing from a close to freezing night or a just below freezing night. So the only stuff we're really worried about is the stuff right at the very end. We'll see how much water comes out when we drain it, but if it's not enough, we've got our little transfer pump and we'll just stuff a length of hose down there and just pull some of the water out and that should stop anything freezing. So that's the plan. Down, down now? Yeah. It's pretty much just there now, I think. So there's basically probably some water left in this bottom section. Yeah. And the air is just bubbling up through. Yeah. Our plan to loosen the valve inside here and let the water drain out worked really well. It was draining pretty well actually on its own and I decided to try and speed it up a little bit just by going and putting some air pressure on there. I just used a bike pump and that works really, really well to be honest with you. Um, it got to the point where there's a vertical standpipe in here that comes up and I think it's pretty much got the uh, the air all the way to there. So there's really just water probably in this in this very bottom section here which is the best protected. It's under the deepest amount of, of cover. So that is absolutely fine. No concerns about that. Overall, today has been a really good day. When we started, the trench here just had the exposed pipe and conduit in it. We've come through, we've added all of the sand to, to kind of pack that in and protect it. We've put the foam insulation board on top and then covered all of that with some more sand as well. Our sand pile is looking a lot smaller than it was this morning. As far as this septic system goes, this is pretty much as far as we can get on our own. We've spoken to our contractor. He's hoping to be here next week. Maybe this weekend uh, they'll drop off some equipment and next week start at least bringing the sand because that mound we've got to construct is a big mound. There's gonna be a lot of sand that has to go up there. So fingers crossed that will happen in the next week or so and soon enough, we will have a working septic system. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, hit that like button. And if you're not already following us on our journey to build our dream house here in Vermont, hit that subscribe button and tag along.